class is in memory of Jared Orchen, and today we will study the Avto of Parshat Shmot. It's on page 1398. It's from the book of Isaiah, chapter 27 of the book of Isaiah, from middle of the chapter 27 till the end, kind of the middle. It's chapter 28, a half of chapter 28, and then two verses on chapter 29 of Isaiah. The combination of the two chapters is really a combination of two parts, two, two prophecies, if you want. The first one is more comforting, optimistic, speaking about the future, the coming of Moshiach. What does this mean, comforting? When a, when a nation is in exile, what happens, what, what happens when people are in exile? They lose hope. That's the worst thing. Jews were in Russia under communism. They lost hope. They didn't. They couldn't find. They didn't find that there is a. There is a reason to hope for something. Another year goes. Ten years. Twenty years. Thirty years. Four years. It's not going nowhere. Strong and. Until a year before the, until a day before the falling, falling of communism, nobody would ever believe that this communism will, fall, will ever collapse. That was a total miracle. One of the big, greatest miracles of the 20th century, a messianic miracle, is the fall of communism. Nobody would, and without one bullet, just collapsed. My mother tells me when they used to sit in Russia, and wish each other they should, you know, Russia was one big jail, you couldn't live. Nobody was allowed to live. He used to wish to himself, may Moshiach will come and we will leave Russia. Mm-hmm. Oh, then what's the Moshiach will come? The prophet Isaiah is in this, in, he, he comes to the concept, Bayomahu, a dead day. Well, what is that day will be? The day of Messianic redemption. The day of Messianic redemption. There is Balai Lo'ahu, that night, and there is Bayom Ahu. Balai Lo'ahu, usually, that night represents exile. That night. Which night? Which night represents exile? Even the night that they came out from Egypt, it's still a night. The night that, uh, uh, when, when, when uh, the king couldn't sleep, the, in the story of, of, the, of Mordechai and Esther, the story of the Megillah, the king of Hashverosh couldn't sleep. He couldn't sleep this night. And there is Bayom Ahu. You know, we sing, we sing every time when we finish the Orlain, we sing Bayom Ahu, Bayom Ahu. At that day, what's going to be that day? Yeah, Hashem Echad, God will be one. Ushmo Echad, and His name will be one. That means to say that the name of God will be, the whole world will be, will recognize the name of God. That's what it's all about. That the prophet Isaiah in this in this in this Torah and in others gives the Jews a reason to to have hope. It's going to be a day that the Jews will be will, will be gathered, and and will be the great the great day will be that he gave them something to look forward, something to hope for. Don't lose hope. The worst situation of a person who is in an exile or is a person who gets lost. And he gives up and looking for the search, the search for the way back. That's, this, this is it. The Magid of Mezrich, once there is a parable from him, he said, he said to God, he said about God, he said, as long as the Jewish people search for God, there is hope. The day they give up on searching, that he said it's like a child who's looking for his father. He looks Sunday, he looks Monday, he looks Tuesday, he looks. When they looking for him, constantly looking for him. The day he stops looking for him, this is the day. The, the, that's the worst thing. When the Jewish people are giving up, are, are giving up on looking for God, giving up on, on the hope that one day they'll go out to make them, that's 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 the worst. That the first, the chapter 27 from this after, the first chapter, is more concentrating on the hope of one day will come out from exile, and what is the and what is the, the condition? You have to stop to worship idols. 
See, as long as we're not, any other sin is within the frame. That's God is God, I'm a Jew. No, I don't do everything. I do the wrong thing. I'm bad, but I'm still a bad boy. When I worship idols, it means I'm going to another, another God, finished. I, I, I caught all the connections. That's why idol worshiping is in the Bible the worst sin. That's why it's compared to a, to a couple that one of them goes to uh, as an affair. Then there is no, a couple can fight and fight and fight, but as long as there is a commitment to each other, there is hope. The moment the commitment is gone, that's it's over. That's what they, that's the first part of the after. And there is, it's important not to make something amazing. The Torah tells you the past. Don't get me wrong, we have to learn the today to them. But it tells you the stories of the past. The prophets tell you the future. The past, remember that. It's a new understanding that I learned this week. That's why in the synagogue we read the Torah, it tells you what happened in the past. And now I tell you what's going to be the future. And it's a different look on the, on the prophets and the Bible and the prophets. Prophets have both, though. I mean, there's a short Obviously. <laughs> obviously. The Torah also is both. Mm -hmm. In the Torah, I mean, the Torah, Moses says it's going to be in the future. You know, going to be. Yeah. But in general, obviously, there is always, there is not, nothing. It's not like a piece of cake. You cut it off in one way. Everything has a combination of everything. But in general, the Torah is more what happened. And the prophet tells you what to look forward. A Jew is a combination of the past and the future. Then he can be a Jew in the present. He has to know his past, and he has to know what he's looking forward. Think about the shofar blowing on Rosh Hashanah. It's reminding us about, the, about Mount Sinai, right? The shofar of Mount Sinai. And it's reminding us about the shofar of the coming of Moshiach. Then we, the past and the future. These two things. That's chapter 27. Chapter 28 is a very strong rebuke of the prophet to a very selfish society that was in Jerusalem and in, and in, and in uh, Samaria. The two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Very busy with themselves, selfish. They, this is not people who were busy with idol worshiping. They were busy with themselves, having fun. It almost sounds like if you look on television, the advertisements from today. I mean, it's, it's nobody thinks about anybody, and he tells them that this is the, because it's a society that doesn't care for anyone and anything, that would bring all the, that, that, that's how it becomes spoiled, and the whole thing falls apart. And he blames the leaders, as usual, by the Jewish people. We always blame the leaders. Because if the leaders would do what they're supposed to do, the Jewish people will never reach so long. But let's start a little bit, and we'll, we'll go the in. In the coming days, Yaakov will take root, Israel will bud and blossom, filling the face of the earth like the produce of the field. Even in the days that God struck Israel, did he strike him, Israel, as he struck those that struck him? He says, the prophet says, it's going to be good days. The Jewish people will take root and they will start to flourish. And he says, even when God punishes the Jews, does he punish them like he punishes the enemies of the Jews? No. Go ahead. What's the answer? Did he slay him as he slew those that slew him, as he struck and slew the Egyptians? Did he ever, that he did to the Jews or the later did to the Egyptians? The Egyptians, he, he put them in the, I mean, he drowned them in the sea that was over. There was nothing left. Did he ever did it to the Jews? No. Only according to their measure of sin did he bring retribution and contend against their fields and gardens, but not take the lives of her inhabitants. Basically, he punished them, but it was the minimum. What is what what the, what the minimum what they deserve? What he can punish them, but he, he did they they were so to speak they were more punished financially, but not the lives. It's interesting, it's written when a person is punished financially, we tell them, maybe you did something wrong. 
or to the punish life and he's losing, losing lives, then we don't tell him that because that says nothing to do with the punishment. The Rebbe once spoke about it. Mm -hmm. Then in the Talmud, and somebody lost, had a big financial loss, they told him you have to do tshuva, you have to repent, maybe he did something wrong. But then somebody has a tra tragedy, we don't tell him maybe you did something wrong because that's from God, that's, that's above, that says nothing to do with punishment. That's something bigger than that. That's a part of the bigger uh, destiny. And that's what he says here. The Jews were not punished only with the minimum, but not, not taking lives away, so to speak. He removed the fruit with a rough wind on the day that the strong east wind blows mightily. Okay, let's con uh, want to continue. Number, number nine. Because, be because my mercy is upon them, it will be easy for them to atone for their sins. Only by this small thing shall Yaakov's sin be atoned. This will be his fruit benefit of removing his sin. When he makes all the stones of the altar as chalk stones crushed to pieces, the idol trees and the sun images shall rise no more. Then if he destroys all the idols, then he will not be punished. Then he will, all his, sin, his sins will be atoned for him. As long as he destroys the idols. No more idols. That's what the prophet is telling them. Is that why Hezekiah and Josiah and other kings were big idol destroyers? That's what, that's what they all, because and you need to understand, in the time of the Bible, there were religious Jews worshipping idols. Strange thing. Putting a film, keeping shadows, worshipping idols. The worshipping idols was, on, they worship God and idols. What is, that? what is that? Elijah tells the Jews? How, ma, how far how long are you going to dance on the two weddings? Ad matayat em poschim ashtay asifim. If the Baal is true, go after the Baal. If God is true, go after God. Why, why, you, why you don't jumping in? He gave a check to the synagogue and a check to the Baal. But, but wasn't there, Rabbi, uh, in the time of the temple, wasn't there a sort of a built-in proclivity of man to worship idols? That's a problem. And then, then they took it away. When we lost prophecy, we lost the idol. You're right. That, what I mean to say, it was an unbelievable strong drive. Uh, drive, exactly, to worship idols. Like today, it's, it's, a, it's family purity, relations, relations with uh, and being committed to your own marriage. It's such a strong drive to do all the wrong things. Much more like this, it was in that time to worship idols. At, for today's people of today cannot even understand what, what was the craziness. You, you know, in uh, last week's Parsha, um, with regard to Leah and Rachel. Yeah, Rachel is trying to steal, to steal the right, idols from your father. Right, but Leah see, accepted Hashem. Leah, you know, when she had the four sons, mm -hmm. each one, she talked about, you yeah. know, maybe he loves me now, and thank God. Yeah. She well, Rachel did not speak about, no, not. she says me, Hashem, give me another son. Rachel did? Rachel said, Yosef, on yeah. the word Leosif, to add mm -hmm. me, Hashem, give me an additional son. Mm -hmm. That was the name Yosef. Mm -hmm. okay. But you're right, it's more, it's more, it's more clear by, by Rachel, by Leah. She says, um, especially by the fourth son, she thanked God. Right. Apam odet Hashem, this time, I will thank God, and she called him Yehuda for the yeah, word of for right. the ah, from the word of thanking. Right. Admitting, yes. She just thanked God, and she didn't say anything about Yaakov. The first by three, the she fourth said, one. By the fourth one. Because she gave gave up on him <laughs> <laughs> and his love that he she <laughs> would get his love. It's interesting, you know. Leah loved Jacob. Jacob loved Rachel. Did Rachel love Jacob? <laughs> it's not written anywhere. Yeah, we don't know. Rachel wanted to have children from Jacob. Did she love Jacob? It's written that Jacob loved Rachel. Yeah. It's written that Leah wanted Jacob. But it's not clear that, Leah, that Rachel loved Jacob. But there's a, some uh, midrash, midrashim that says uh, Rachel knew that Leah would be a better husband better for Jacob, a better wife for Jacob. 
Listen, it takes a lot to, to do what, what Leah did, what Rachel did. Okay, let's continue. Number 10 are we? We are we? 10, yeah. Okay, um, Mr. Cohen. It's on the right hand side of the page. Number 10. Number yeah. 10. Then the great city will be lonely. Its dwelling place will be empty from its inhabitants, forlorn like the desert. In its place, a calf will graze and it will rest and consume the tree branches that grow there. It means to say everything will be lonely because the, the, the God will take, so to speak, revenge for the idol worshiping, but he will not destroy everything. It will still be a place that, that, that they can walk around if you want. It's all a metaphorical prophecy on what's going to happen to the Jews. Number 11, continue. Okay, when their Edom's measure of sin has reached its limit, they will have their downfall. A nation of feminine weakness will come and destroy it. For it, Edom is not an understanding nation to know that God is the one who gave them any power in the first place. Therefore, its maker will not have mercy upon it and its creator will not find favor in it. Okay, that, and the Jewish people, God has Rahman, has his mercy, and he's not destroying them completely. And Edom, when they will destroy it, he will destroy it completely. Nothing will be left. Why, why does uh, Esau do, you know, not too bad in the Torah, uh, but by the time you get to the half Torah, I mean, certainly uh, in Ov Ovadia here and some other places, Edom is doing pretty bad. Right, right. <laughs> because it, right. because right. it's a difference between Esau and Edom. Mm -hmm. Esau is a person, Edom is a nation. Mm -hmm. The person Esau was not so bad. But what it came out of it was Edom, and Edom was bad. But God did give uh, um, Esau the blessing that he would create a great nation too. You're right, but if they, if they chose to be bad, then eventually, 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 even, even, even Esau, so to speak, will join the Jewish people. The Edom will go, that, we, that is going to be destroyed in general is the Edom that doesn't want to accept God. I Edomite, an Amalekite who wants to accept God, you're more than welcome. Mm -hmm. See, even Amalek, it's written about, Amalek is really Edom. If you think about it, Amalek mm -hmm. is the grandson of, of, of Esau, right? <laughs> it's written in the Torah, you have to destroy the Amalekites, right? Then comes the Talmud and said, you know, the grandchildren of Haman learn Torah in Bnei Brak. Who is Haman? A descendant of whom? Of Amalek, yeah. right? And now that they learn Torah in the neighborhood, he was supposed to, supposed to be destroyed and killed. Obviously, they are not. As long as they join the belief of God, they're okay. It's only if they don't. The same thing is here. All the bad predictions are not for anybody. They're only if you don't live up to what, to, if you don't accept the belief of God, if you continue to worship idols then it's not like the doom and gloom that the whole world is going to be destroyed. Only if, it's got, if the, person, the person or the nation or the family is not accepting God. Only the bad part. <laughs> exactly. God doesn't want to destroy the world. It's not going to be the whole world going to be destroyed and desolated. Absolutely not. Rabbi, what's meant by um, uh, when, uh, when their measure of sin has reached its limit, they will have their downfall. A nation of feminine or weakness or feminine weakness will come and destroy it. It means to say even a, weak, a very weak thing can destroy them. They will be so weak that even a feminine power can destroy them. It means to say they will be, they will be gone like this. The time will come they will be wiped out. They think they are so strong. As I bought the example of, of Russia, they collapsed from inside without one bullet. They were gone. People give credit to, to Reagan. He said, uh, Gorbachev, take off the wall. Took more than take off the wall to, to, to this too. What I need to say is that, that you think they are they are strong and they are big and then they are like played or they're falling apart like nothing. No, I actually was wondering if that was a foretelling of I can't think of the the woman's name that destroyed the Roman emperor. She seduced him and it was that woman. Talking about in the Bible, in the in the story of Hanukkah. 
No, not, not, Hel- not Helen of Troy. No, no, no. no. Judith? It, 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 was, it was Roman. It was, because um, that would make sense with this. But, uh, I can't think of it. Not Anthony and Cleopatra. Right? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Cleopatra. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Because Anthony was uh, Roman. Yeah. This is the predecessor, right? Could be. Yeah, Roman is, is Adam, no question right. about that. Okay, let's continue. Where are we? Uh, Twelve. Twelve. <coughs> it will be on that day that God will... On re- that day! Go ahead, what will be on, on that day? On that day that God will remove the produce, Israel, from the husks, the nations from Assyria which lie beside the Euphrates River until the land of Egypt, and you will be gathered one by one. Children of Israel. One by one, by one, one will the Jewish people yeah. will be gathered. It's an amazing, comforting prophecy. God will collect each Jew at a time. Take him by his collar, like this, and schlep him. No Jew will be left behind. Not the, 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 the used to be the, the famous line, no child will be left behind. Mm-hmm. No Jew will be left behind. That's the policy of Chabad. Now Chabad didn't make this up, it's coming from here. You will be collected one by one, the Jewish people. It's not like, oh, we have 30 million. Okay, one million couldn't make it. Goodbye, let's move on. Every Jew is important. When this happened, this happened, you know, we, we read in the God of Pesach, we have the four sons. The wise one, the wicked one, right? The simpleton and the one who does not ask. The wicked one says, what is this work for you? What do you tell him? What do you answer him? Who remembers? It's not for you. If you would be there, yeah. you wouldn't be redeemed. Right, it's not for you. Very, very encouraging, huh? You bring, you bring your son to the Seder, tell him, you, get out of here, you will never be redeemed. What kind, of, what kind of a business is this? What kind of an answer is that? That's what you call him for the, to the God, to tell him that he's not welcome? Oh, you, because you ask such questions, you make me nervous? If you would be in Egypt, you would leave you there. What are you really telling him? In Egypt, before Mount Sinai, not all the Jews left. 20% left, whatever. Not everybody left. The Jews who didn't want to leave, they were Jews who were very nice, they were comfortable, and they said, I'm not going to the desert. Reb Moshe sent us a telegram, if things are good, if the weather is not bad, and so on, we might, we might consider. Find Florida, let us know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if you find the second promised land, we might come. That was in Egypt. After Mount Sinai, we cannot lose one Jew. We tell this wicked son, if you would be in Egypt, you wouldn't be redeemed. But here, you will be redeemed. We have to deal with you. We have to bring you around. Because we cannot be redeemed if there is one Jew missing. And that's what the, the Rebbe is to quote this line thousands of times. Ba'atem te to you'll be collected one by one, the Jewish people, the children of Israel. That becomes even better than that, the next line. Ahoyo bayoyim ahu, it will be that day, number 13, and it will be on that day. And it will be on that day as though a great shofar will be blown to call everyone to gather, and those who were lost in the land of Assyria and those who are cast away in the land of Egypt will come and bow down to God upon the holy mountain in Jerusalem. Well, this line, this paragraph, this verse, is one of the most powerful lines in the whole Bible. We recite it in the Amida of Rosh Hashanah. will be at that day. Itaka beshofar gadol, the great shofar will be sound, the sound. We'll hear the sound of the great Shofar. And the lost from the land of Ashur will come. And, the, and those who are away in the land of Egypt, Nidachim. There is Ovdim and there is Nidachim. The, one, the Ovdim, Oved is, is lost. Nidachim is even worse than that. The people are like pushed away, away, away. In the land of Egypt, all of them will come, bow down, and the holy mountain in Jerusalem. But first of all, Assyria and Egypt. 
What's the difference between the two king, between the two exiles? The Jews were exiled first in Egypt, right, for for 210 years. Then came the Assyrian king during the the first temple, and exiled part by the ten plagues. The ten tribes were exiled in the Assyrian kingdom. Where are they? They never for came sure. back. <laughs> Why? They assimilated. Why? They're spread out. They, they, idol worship. Life was good. <laughs> life was good. In Egypt, life was bad. They were still Jewish. In Assyria, life was good. They were not It doesn't take a genius. But here, he speaks about, in today's world, I mean, until, until the collapse of, of, of the Soviet Union, we used to say that Assyrian exile is America. The Egyptian exile is Russia. We left the Jews who come from this exile and the Jews who come from this exile, both of them, you see, the Jews who come from the good exile, they are lost. Nobody is pushing them away, they are lost. The Jews who are suffering from a bad exile are being pushed away by the, by the nation who, who they are, they are, they are suffering. All of them will come to the mount, to the holy mount in Jerusalem to bow down. That will be the Moshe who come. But he speaks about the great Shofar. Who is going to blow the great Shofar? It's not written. The great Shofar, little, I mean, Elijah. could be Elijah, could be God. The sound of the great Shofar. When the Jewish people were woken up at Mount Sinai for the sound of the great Shofar, who blew the Shofar? Yeah, must have been God. Must have been God, not yeah. me, not you. Obviously, God. It was another Shofar. It's written by the end. Uh, Moses, God warned them that when they can go back on the Mount Sinai, when the shofar will be sound, and then they know that the Mount Sinai is not holy anymore, they can go back. That was the sound of the shofar that probably Moses was blowing. Then we have the two shofars. We have a shofar of God and a shofar of Moses. It's almost the shofar of Rosh Hashanah and the shofar of the end of Yom Kippur to say that the holiness is over. Then, that's, that's what, now, this verse is recited, as I said, in Rosh Hashanah. I'll tell you a little bit, a little class about the Rosh Hashanah service. Just by the way, we're not too many here, we can, we can speak a little bit about it. Every Amida is divided into three sections. The first three is the welcome, the hello, the introduction to the, to the Amida, to God. The last three is the goodbye, in the middle. During the week, in the middle is a long middle of, 17, of 13 blessings. On Shabbat, at the same first three, the same last three. Always the same first three, the same beginning and the same end. What is changing? The middle. Instead of 13 blessings, we have one big blessing, one long blessing on Shabbat. It speaks usually about Shabbat. If it's Rosh Chodesh, Musaf of Rosh Chodesh speaks about Rosh Chodesh. If it's Shavuot, it speaks about Shavuot. So called one blessing. The Damid of Shabbat and Yontep is from se- made of seven blessings. Three in the beginning, three in the end, and one big one in the middle. Every Amida, except of Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah, as the Musaf of Rosh Hashanah, is, is the three first one, the three, three last one are the same. But in the middle, it's three long blessings. Not one, three. Not even Yom Kippur, only Rosh Hashanah. And what is the tree? The tree are called Malchuyot, kingdom. Speaks about the kingdom of God, that God created the world and is the king of the world. Zikronot. Very good, Zikronot. Asking for God. And Shofarot. Zikronot means God to to remember us. Right. And Shofarot is speaking about the blowing of the Shofar. Now, every one of them, of these three blessings, has quotes of the Bible. That Malchuyot has 10 verses from the Bible. 10 verses that speaks the quote from the Bible where God is mentioned as the king, as the king of the world. And it goes like this, three, they, they quote three verses from the five books of Moses, three verses from the book of Psalms, from scriptures, if you want, and three verses from the prophet. And then the last one is again from the Bible. Three, 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 and one. 
תנ״ך, right? תורה, נביאים כתובים, the, the Torah, the, Bible, the five books of Moses, the prophets and the scriptures. The order there goes like this, the Bible, the scriptures and the prophet. Three, three and three. It's true about machriot, it's true about zichonot, it's true about shafarot. The three pressing, have the same thing. Every one of them has three, for example, zichonot is ten verses from the Bible that speaks about God remembering. It is God remembered the, uh, I think Noah when he, when he before before he and he took him out from the from the ark. That's one rem, a mention of remembrance and so on and on. Three from the from the five books of Moses, three from the book of Psalms, from the scriptures, and three from the prophet, and one in the, from, again from the Bible. And the same thing is about shof, uh, shofarot, the mentioning of the shofar. Ten verses with the, the word shofar is mentioned in a good way. Then there is a big question here. Usually the order of the Tanakh, of the Bible, is Torah, first the five books of Moses, then comes the prophet, then comes the scripture. Why is it that in this, in the Amida service, it's the Torah, yeah, the scriptures, then the, then the prophet? What do you think? Prophets are talking about the future and the messianic redemption. Oh. That's what I told you in the beginning. <laughs> the Torah is the, is the past. Mm -hmm. The scripture, the book of Psalms, speaks more about the present. How much we suffer, we want God to help us today. How are we living? And the prophet tells us about the future. Then, in, for example, about Shofarot, the prayer that speaks about the Amida, the, the blessing that speaks about the blowing of the Shofar, that the first, in the first three verses, it's quoted about the, the sound of the shofar that was at Mount Sinai, the past. Then the middle speaks about our present verses from the shofar, about, we should, uh, about uh, verses from the scriptures that we should blow the shofar while today. And then it's, talking, it's quoted this line. This verse is quoted as the last, last verse, uh, of the, the, the not one before the last verse, that will be on that day. The great shofar will be. Right. And those the, 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 the past, the present, and the future. The three blessings themselves are having the, are everything in common. Malchuyot, kingship, is speaking about the God creating the world. God is the boss. That was the beginning. That was the past. Zichronot speaks about the present. What's Zichron? I'm asking for God to remember me now, today. Remember me, give me a good day. Give me a good life. Shofarot, sounding of the shofar is about the future in general. Yeah, we mentioned also the past, as I told you in the beginning. Nothing is only past and nothing is only future. But in general, it's about the future. It's, a, it's an amazing understanding of the structure of the Amida from Rosh Hashanah. And really of the whole system, how it works. The, pre, the past, the present, the future. In essence, we can say it about the regular Amida. The Amida of every day of the week, during the week. The first three speak about Baruch HaTashem, God, the God of our Father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who promised us the resurrection of the dead. It's more the past. The end speaks about you should return back to Zion, right? And bring peace among Jews about the future. Right? And the middle is what about? Give me a good life, bless our land, give us rain, cure us. We are sick, my stomach is hating me, my back is hurting me. Present. That the past, the present, and the future. And the problem of modern society, the biggest problem in my opinion, is that the, most of the Jewish people in today do not do, do not do not know their past. If you don't know your past, you don't know what to look for the future. A person who do, they made studies that kids who know the history of the family do better in life. On every level. You ask a regular American Jew what he knows is the history of the Jewish people, the Holocaust. Anything before it is Adam and Eve. Between Adam and Eve and the Holocaust there is nothing in between. 
it's a tragedy because when you don't know your past, you don't know you don't know what to expect in the in the present, first of all, and you don't know the future what the future brings to you. A person who grew up with a with a sense of history, he smells evil from a mile away. He senses it. No, the, 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 this comment that doesn't I don't like it. The, this this kind of behavior is not good for us. Because he knows, he read, he knows what happened, he knows how the, how every bad thing started, only with one little comment, only with one little thing. And really we live everything. We live we live in the present, but we have in our mind our past and we are directing our action towards the towards the future. When a person has to make a decision about which education to give his child, he shouldn't ask himself if it's easy for me today. He should make a decision. In 20 years, where I want to see my son. I was in a wedding not long ago, and I said by the hook, I said, this family, I said, every day of their life, they aim for this day, for the day of the hook, that the children should get married in a Jewish way, a traditional way, that they raise the kids, they made decisions according to this. And that's, you have to, you have to live in the present, but aim for the future. Where are you going? And the, in the story of the shofar and the blowing of the shofar has everything. You have the, the past, the blowing of the shofar reminds us about Mount Sinai, reminds us about the coming of Mashiach. When the Jew stands in solemn eye and holding a shofar in his mouth and blowing the shofar, or he listens to the shofar, he's not a lost soul, he doesn't know where he's going, where he's coming. I know from where I'm coming and I know where I'm going. Right. Because the path is very clear. If you don't have consciousness and knowledge of the past, then you're you're, you're probably doomed to repeat absolutely. absolutely some of the tragedies the possibly tragedies that occurred in the past that could be prevented in the future. absolutely absolutely and that's the biggest problem that always all the tragedies that happen to the Jewish people it's usually because they want they didn't want to admit that it happened in the past and this behavior was bringing the same thing again we're different we are different yeah Exactly. Times are different. Things are different. This is right. One it's just, right. It's just, right. Yeah. You know, we already tried everything. We tried to be rich. The, the, we were hated for being rich. We were tried to be poor. We were hated for being poor. We were hated for being religious. We were hated for being not religious. We were hated for being tall. We were hated for being short. For whatever you want. Then don't. Every time people say, "Oh, this time we, I, I, we figured it out. Now we are going to make it. That's going to be peace. That's going to be amazing." Mm -hmm. That's so important to know that, and this is what what's happening in this line. It's already been figured out. It's only these missing pages <laughs> between Adam and the present. <laughs> now we we'll go to chapter twenty-eight. Continue the after. War. Oh. War means the beginning of a new. Woe to the crown of arrogance that is upon Ephraim's drunkards. It will quickly be destroyed as fast as a withering blossom. So shall befall the glory of his splendor, the head so pampered, it is as full of oil as a valley of oil. What he says here, the prophet says, you're drunk. You don't think about the future. You don't care for anything. You're so happy with yourself. You don't, you the, you don't see with the, with, the, with the dangers is coming closer. You're drunk. You're busy with yourself. You're having fun and you're good and you couldn't care less. Continue. Yeah. Number two. Behold, God's wind is strong and powerful, as the hail that breaks the trees, like the devastating storm which causes destruction, as the speedy flow of mighty water shall the mighty wind hurl their crown of arrogance and throw it upon the ground with a mighty hand. Continue. By the feet of the enemy shall be the smother, the crown of arrogance of the drunkards of Ephraim. Who is Ephraim? Ephraim is the southern kingdom. Northern. Northern. The northern kingdom, yeah, I'm northern. sorry. They were they were the they were the kings of the Jewish people of the Jew, of the ten tribes. Therefore, the all they call the old kingdom is called the kingdom of Ephraim. And he says you'll be wiped out. You think you're you 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 you're so big, you're so happy, you have it all. Economy is booming. You can do whatever you want. If you don't wake up and you don't see what's happening around you, then then it's, that's what's going to happen to you. Number four. The glory of their splendor, which is similar to a withering blossom, which is like a crown upon the head, which is like a valley of oil, will be like a fig, 
which is prematurely ripened before summer. In what happens to figures pre premature uh, while ripened before the summer? Go ahead. Uh, so uh, one uh, who sees it will immediately swallow it. Well, it's it too small. It's still in his hand. He swallowed it. It's nothing. That's how the whole fine will be like this. He pulled out like a, like a by the way. You think you're so strong? We have such we have the strongest uh, army in the world. We can do this. Like this could be wiped out. History never repeats. Okay. Uh, Syrians are coming. Watch out. Number f number five. Number five. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. On that day, God. On that day. <laughs> God, the Master of Legions, will be in the crown of glory. A diadem of beauty and a remnant of his people, the tribes of Yehuda and Benjamin. He will be a spirit, inspiration of justice to Hezekiah, who presides upon the seat of judgment, and for strength to those of Yehuda who will go to war. Now he says at that day, what will be left? If a fine will be dis uh, destroyed, what will be left? The, 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 the kingdom of Judah. They will be left. They will be the crown. God will be a crown to the to the remnants of his of the Jew, of his people. That's the kingdom of Judah. But he right away the prophet Isaiah right away put turns to the kingdom of Judah and he gives them he gives them the same reprimand. He doesn't he doesn't leave any mercy there. Go ahead, number six. Quick, number quick question before we get there. He's, he's talking about Hezekiah here. Now he's talking about the future, uh, you know, in that day, right? Uh, now is he, by necessity, saying that Hezekiah will be the Messiah then? See, Hezekiah, Hezekiah is in parentheses, if I remember. Yeah, it's it's right. Rashi. Yeah. It's not it's not in the text. He speaks about the future, but if Hezekiah would do the right, would do it, would make a complete job, he would be the Messiah. That's what the Talmud says. Yeah, I mean, there's the one viewpoint that Hezekiah will mm -hmm. be the future Messiah, or yeah, Hezekiah, and another viewpoint that Hezekiah could have been the Messiah but blew it. Was Hezekiah, was he the grandfather of Josiah? Um, yes, because Hezekiah, Manasseh, Josiah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. But in his time, it was, an, it was an amazing situation. The spirituality in the Jewish people was in the highest level it could be. And the miracles that God gave to the Jewish people were like almost like the exodus from Egypt. He was pretty much second to David. <laughs> yeah. But he had, he had a very little uh, kingdom. At that point, it was the whole Hesky, the whole kingdom yeah. was like a like a suke. You know what I mean? <laughs> there was nothing left all yeah, around. Yeah, Jerusalem. Yeah. I mean, Kemeluna Bakerem. The the, the way Isaiah actually describes it, or Jeremiah, it says like a like a hut who protects the you know in the in the end, by the entrance of a, of a big uh, field. There is the 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 guy, the guard sits in a little hut. A guard post. A guard post. Guard that's, post. A, that's how the prophet describes Jerusalem. <laughs> a Syrian came and, and took everything around. And he left Jerusalem. No. A shvach I mean, wasn't anything, was nothing to write home about. Mm -hmm. They didn't think it was worth anything. No, they didn't destroy it because God made a huge miracle. They came to Jerusalem on the night of Pesach and the night before Pesach, the day before Pesach, and he came with 70,000 70, soldiers, 72 or 75, whatever. It's more than 185, I think. <laughs> 185, maybe. This is where, where Hashem kills them all? Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. Uh, uh, the uh, same thing, Sancherif, Sancherif comes. 180,000. Mm -hmm. so, so 180, so thank you. So Sancherif comes, and he, and he says, oh, these guys, forget about to die. Tonight my soldiers are tired. Tomorrow, everyone will throw one stone, will destroy Jerusalem. He was right. Rav Shoke, his head of the army, who was a Jew, told them, don't wait, because this is the night that's known that was the night of Pesach. This is the night of, night of miracles to the Jewish people. He laughed at them. That night, they all died, and the rest ran away, and that was over. The war was over. Then God made the miracles that were unbelievable to his care. Hezekiah said to God, God, I'm sick, I'm laying in the bed, and you make miracles. And God listened. There had to be more soldiers than Pharaoh had, right? That, that drowned in the Red Sea. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yes. But he didn't praise. He didn't praise God for the Red Sea. Oh, because the town came, comes the town and says that really God wanted to make Hezekiah the Mashiach. 
Why was no Mashiach? Because they didn't thank God, they didn't praise God. Unbelievable. It means to say how much we have to be careful to praise God for miracles. When we see a miracle happen in front of the eyes, we have to say, we have to speak about it. Not just to say, uh huh, uh huh. Recognize it and praise God for it. So if we've got this viewpoint that Hezekiah blew it, that he didn't become the Messiah mm -hmm. back then, why do you think there's such a strong tendency, or at least in certain groups, to say Hezekiah will be the Messiah in the future? Here he doesn't refer that Hezekiah will be the, in the future. He speaks about the present, mm -hmm. of the time of Isaiah. Then Hezekiah was the man who was in charge of the judgment and justice mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah, okay, I don't so, think so here it's not future. It's not about the future, no. Because it says on that day, you know, verse 5. This idea that Hezekiah will be the Moshiach is one opinion. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not the majority of the opinions. No, mm -hmm. not at all. Okay, where are we? As we are uh, six. We're still on uh, seven. Uh, no? Okay. I don't know where, where are we? Uh, we didn't quite finish uh, six. six. Four. Okay, finish. Oh. They will. You're finished. They will not need to fight. You will not need to fight because they will not need to fight because God will fight for them, and they will be able to return from the place of battle to fortify the gate of the city. Yeah, maybe I think that's why it's repeating the Hezekiah. Who, who was fighting for them? When was God fighting for the Jewish people? Yeah, when he went to the heart that that's, yeah. that's what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, number seven. Though they too, Yehuda and Benjamin, have erred through being drunk of wine and stagger through strong drink. The priest and the false prophet erred because of strong drink, mistaken about what they about what they saw. They stumble in judgment. Okay, what is he saying here? He says Jerusalem is not better. They are also drunk. And who is he blaming? The priest, the prophets. He says if you would be good, the whole society would be good. The priest and the prophets are the leaders. Mm -hmm. Was well, calling them false prophets, though. Parenthesis. No, oh, it's true. What I need to say is, the true prophet, the same true prophet, uh, the prophet can be the prophets, the leaders. That's the bottom line. A, a false prophet is also a leader. He's a leader in a bad way, but he's a leader. If, if he wouldn't be a leader, nobody would listen to so, him. So, Rabbi, which prophet is saying this? This is Isaiah. Isaiah. So, who's he describing as the prophet? There was uh, in his time was what's his name? Yeah, Hananiah ben Azor was a false prophet. He said things will be good. The vessels from Jerusalem, the vessels from Babylon will come back to Jerusalem. Don't worry, it's going to be amazing. In time of Jeremiah, right? Mm -hmm. There were many false prophets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there were a dime a dozen. So was Jeremiah also alive at that time? Jeremiah was a little later. A little later, yeah. mm -hmm. But Isaiah, I mean, the prophet doesn't speak of, only of today. The prophet predicts the future. For sure. Don't forget, there were a lot of prophets back then, too. I mean, the Talmud says there are a million prophets. Really? It just wasn't the, the guys we know. Yeah, not every, uh -huh. yeah, there were, there were many prophets, but not the prophecies, they were war to be, the, they were lessons for generations to come, they were written. The rest of them were not written down. Do you know, Jeremiah was 8th century, seven, yeah, 700. He, he's, he's with the Babylonian exile. Yeah, and Isaiah is, is the before, before Syrian the, exile. Before, yeah. Yeah. Right, yes, right, yes, right. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. What do we number here? Eight. Eight. For me? Yeah. For all the tables they eat at are full of vomit and filth, so that there is no place clean. Because the adults have turned to in sobriety, to whom shall the prophet teach knowledge? And who shall understand what the prophet has heard from God? To those who are just weaned from the milk and removed from their mother's breasts? Oh, the, the prophet is here saying, who, who is going, going to teach? The adults, the adults don't want to listen. They said it's, it's baby talk. It's, they say Judaism is for children. Sounds familiar. I like the menorah only when my kids are home. The kids are left home, they're in college. Why am I not lighting the menorah? I did it for the children. It's over. I did it for my grandchildren. For myself, I don't need it. That's what, they say. That's what he's complaining about. He's also saying that, they're too, that the young ones are too, too young to understand. Exactly. But also, there is a le there is, on the other end, you can say that you have to teach the young ones too. Right, of course. 
Go ahead, continue, because... Because of their indulgence, they are so distant from God's commandments that they require precautionary laws, one law on top of another, one law on top of another. As the measuring tool of a builder keeps each row of bricks in place, the prophet must give a measuring line for a measuring line, a measuring line for a measuring line. A little there, very little there, that is, even where the Torah is learned, very few study it, as it is considered a burden. This, commentary, this verse has a few commentaries. One of the commentaries says that the people of Jerusalem said, the Torah, a bunch of laws who don't make sense, a little here, a little there, don't do this, don't do this. They didn't understand the comprehension. They didn't comprehend the, the, the greatness of the whole Torah that's a way of life. They looked to me like it's a bunch of laws that don't make sense. They didn't appreciate what the Torah is all about. It says it's a measure here, a measure there, something here, something there. They, 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 they did, they, and therefore they didn't want to hear it. That's why they didn't want to learn it. So, so is the fault then again on the leaders, both uh, civil leaders and the religious leaders? Absolutely. Or is it on the people as well? It's on the people, but why the people reach them? Because, because the leaders allowed, allowed it to, yeah. to reach them. Because the, the, the leaders didn't live up to their, to their potential, to their what they are supposed to do. Did you leave? Um, uh, you want me to keep going? Or, you okay, you can do 11. Uh, yeah, 11. Yeah, 11. Yeah. For with unintelligible speech in another language do the prophet's words appear to this people. It was, it, it was appeared to the people like unintelligible the message. That the prophet is speaking to children. Oh, mitzvah here, mitzvah there, there. Oh, it's a bunch of jokes. To go talk to the kids. We don't. We are, we are intelligent people. We don't need this. This nonsense. That's how they looked on the Torah and the prophet. What the prophet says. And we don't need the daily security report either. Intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> Referring to Trump. <laughs> he might be right. Uh, although he speaks for their benefit and he tells them, this is how you will find tranquility. Leave the weary alone and do not rob them. That is how you will find satisfaction, but they do not desire to listen. He says, if you want to have a good life, do not abuse the, pe the weaker people. Take care, I mean, at least leave them alone. <laughs> if you don't, don't hurt them. Okay. To them? To, to them, the word of God was a law to a law, a law to a law. A measuring line to a measuring line, a measuring line to a measuring line. Appeared as if as a precaution of a precaution, not as something important. Not something important. That was the problem. They looked on the laws of the Torah as a child version of, Ju of Judaism. They don't do this or this. Who cares? They didn't understand that it's a way of life, that God gives us the best way of life that a person can have. And the way the world should be, it should exist and flourish. A little there, just. very little there, even where Torah is studied, it has a minute significance. Therefore, because they did not listen to the Torah, when they go on a path, they will stumble, fall backwards, be broken, trapped, and captured. Okay. That's the bad news. Now, now, because we learned once that the Torah must end on a good note, every of Torah, everything we, uh, 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 in, finish, in Judaism, we don't finish on a bad note. Then happy ending. Happy ending. <laughs> Judaism invented the concept of happy ending. Really? Disney. Therefore, Disney will who okay the Disney Jews. <laughs> therefore, therefore, we quit. We quote from chapter twenty-nine, from the middle of chapter twenty-nine, two verses. Therefore, this is what God, who redeemed Abraham from the furnace of Urkazdim, says to the house of Yaakov: Yaakov shall no longer be shamed. When his children return, nor shall his face now become pale. Okay. First of all, one of the meanings here, Jacob who redeemed Abraham. What does this mean? <coughs> Jacob. Oh, 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 before we go to Chesed. On a simple level, if Jacob would not raise a family of Jews, Abraham's well, legacy would be gone. Well, mm -hmm. yeah. You see, Abraham made converts and people who believed in God. And they disappeared. They're gone. Where are they? You met, you met your grandchildren? And I never met them. Why? I think, my opinion, my personal opinion, the moment they heard about you have to take the court, 
they disappeared. <laughs> as long as it was a philosophy, yeah, sure, we all were, yeah, very nice. As long as we eat Cholent, that's a very nice religion. Oh, I did a circumcision you on mean that. I gotta cut my penis? <laughs> That, that was that was over. But then who saved, who redeemed Jacob, who redeemed Abraham? Jacob. Right. Twelve boys and a dog. Jacob and a girl. said, "We cannot rely on other people. I will have my own children, mm -hmm. and then I will establish the Jewish people. You can rely on this and have friends and good friends and nice neighbors. <laughs> it's over." I heard he did it because of a tip. Yes. He did it because of a tip. Yeah, that's <laughs> It's a it's a joke. It's a joke. Circumcision joke. Circumcision joke. Circumcision joke. <laughs> Number 23. Yeah. What is he saying? They have nothing to be ashamed of. Why? Number 23. Because when he sees his children, the work of my hands in his midst, they shall sanctify my name and sanctify the Holy One of Yaakov and shall praise the God of Israel. When you see the children, the Talmud says Jacob never died. What means he never died? It was a funeral. But in the Bible, when Jacob died, it's written, the word died is not written, it's written, he expired. Thomas says, why it's not written, died? As long as the children of Jacob continue in his way, Jacob never died. Jacob is still alive, kicking and becoming more alive. Every Jew that lives more, is Jacob more alive than he was alive and he was alive. When he was alive, he was just one person. Now he's millions, he's dead in millions. Mm -hmm. So is that the name? Uh, is that the significance to the name Israel then? Why we're called Yisrael, struggle with God, or, or just the children of ja uh, children? Of we are Jacob. children. What are we called? Called the children of, of of Israel, not the children of Jacob. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because that makes us stronger and stronger and stronger. Mm -hmm. The Talmud says, "Mazar Obachaim." If his children are alive, he is alive. And the Rebbe spoke about that about the Chabad Hasidus and the Rebbe's said even even when the previous Rebbe passed away. The Rebbe is still alive because when Hasidim go, continue in his legacy, the same thing, when are we alive? When we are alive, it's not a big achievement to be alive. <laughs> you're not dead. <laughs> you didn't kill yourself, you're alive. But when your children and grandchildren continue your ways, then you're really alive. And, and wouldn't they say the same about Abraham and, and Isaac?